Watch vlog! vlog. Welcome to the Art Vlog with me, George Dopamine. The Art Vlog takes you to galleries and exhibitions across Britain and the world. Today, we are back in central London after our visit to the Picasso exhibition at the Royal Academy last week. Please do watch that video if you haven't already, and please do subscribe to the Art Vlog for updates. Today, as you can see, I'm on a very, very special place, the Royal Now in London. And we're here to go to one of my favorite galleries, the Institute of Contemporary Arts, or the ICA. Yep, guys, we are getting radical today. The ICA was set up in 1946 um, by a collective of artists to provide a space for alternative, cutting-edge, contemporary art. And it's obviously expanded over time to include films and shows and poetry as well. With the ICA's history of breaking new artists, it's apt today that we're going to be reviewing a show by an artist that I certainly wasn't aware of before last week and which we haven't seen before. This artist is an American artist called Cameron Rowland. He's only 32 years old. He's exhibited at, um, or some of his works have certainly been shown at MoMA in New York and also at the Los Angeles um, Museum of Contemporary Art. I'm really intrigued to see his show today. He's a recipient of a MacArthur um, Fellowship, that prestigious genius grant given to people in many different fields to allow them to have some money to be able to explore their work in lots and lots of detail. Um, I don't know much about him to be honest, so I'm coming in with quite an open mind. I know he's interested in the discourse between property, slavery and racism from a bit of research I've done. And, um, but, but as I say, this is the first time that we've had the chance to see his work in a solo show in the United Kingdom. Um, so I'm really intrigued to see, is he going to be another one of those artists who started off at the ICA and in 20 years time are now exhibiting at the Royal Academy or the Tate, or Tate Modern as um, Tacita Dean and Damon Hurst and others have done? Or is he gonna be an artist that maybe disappears? The ICA is all about taking risks so you never know really what you're going to see. But do come inside and join me as we um, go to review the show by Cameron Rowland at the ICA. Here we are, here's the front door anyway, the ICA. Ooh. And straight away you can see the lovely bookshop, which I love, um, with some really interesting works um, here. Thing. The exhibition, by the way, is £5, free for members. I've never actually been a member of the, uh, of the um, ICA, um, but do come here a lot, and as you can see, the bar's open as well, so um, come along, bookstore's open, so it's really, really good. Let's just have a look over here as well. Ooh, there's a sale on. I have to say, if I had more money, I'd be here. I just wanted to give you an overview of the lower gallery, although for reasons I'll explain later in the vlog, I'm not going to be filming any individual objects at this moment in time. The bar is quite a beautiful space with loads of light, and you can have tea, coffees, drinks, and also meals here. Wow, well I've just come out of the um, Cameron Rowland show. And if Picasso at the Royal Academy last week was what I would probably describe as a universal crowd pleaser, um, this show will be much, much more divisive. I got a lot from it and I enjoyed bits of it a lot, but it certainly won't be everybody's cup of tea. It was conceptual art um, at a quite challenging level in lots of ways. You were given this, um, this kind of tome as you came in, um, footnoted tome, which is full of very, very interesting information, but quite dense, um, and it related some ex to some ex exhibits. Um, the galleries themselves are quite sparse because actually the meaning of the show is found in this. So I really need to have a think about it before before I give this a fair and proper review. So I'm going to head back to Dopamine Heights on the train, have a cup of tea, have a think, and then I'm gonna bring the review back to you. Right, well, I'm back at um, Dopamine Heights. Storm Kira is raging outside, and I'm very pleased to be um, here with a nice cup of tea to be able to give my final thoughts on the Cameron Rowland show, which I saw yesterday uh, at the ICA. Um, my view is, is very similar to the view that I um, shared on the Mall. Um, this is a show that will split opinion. 
I think that if you entered um, the galleries having paid five pounds and wandered round without really engaging with the text, then this show might be a crushing disappointment. Um, you will be confronted with near empty galleries and a few random objects, 16 in all, including objects which are actually part of the building. And you might come away feeling that this is an example of elitist conceptual art at its worst. But if you engage with the text, a powerful piece of conceptual site-specific activist art emerges. And um, I fall into that second camp. I got a huge amount from this show. Um, I do recommend that you look at the website before you, the ICA website, before you go in, into the show, because lots of the information in the text is actually available there um, online. And you, so you can prepare um, for the show itself. Each piece within the show is accompanied by text, which is footnoted. And out of respect for the artist, um, I haven't actually shown you many of these on this um, on this vlog review because Cameron Rowland believes that the uh, art objects can only be understood with the text. And so if I just showed you the objects, then that would be doing a disservice to them and to him. And I suppose that raises a really interesting question. Should we need text to explain art. Clearly, if you go into a show like P the Pierre Bonnard retrospective at Tate Modern, um, uh, the, the, the paintings are self-explanatory. But personally, I do not have a problem with this. Um, the, the text is, is, is there to give um, that contextual background which makes the show complete and i'm not scared of, of a sort of more academic show of which this deeply is because you learn so much from it one of the most powerful messages i got from this show is that despite the fact that slavery was abolished in the 19th century um, the ramifications and consequences for both those who owned slaves and those who are descended from slaves still um, reverberates through the centuries both in financial terms, with advantage for, for, for the former group and disadvantage for the latter, but also in terms of mindset. One of the, one of the works which shows this incredibly um, starkly is a work called Probability of Escape. The objects in the gallery are very, very, um, at first seem insignificant. They're just three police car searchlights attached to a wall in the lower gallery and you'd almost walk past them without second notice. But when you consult the text, um, they refer to three laws, one from what Barbados in 1688, one from South Carolina in 1690, and then a comparison with a current law that was actually passed in the South Carolina state legislature in 2012. And the similarity in mindset between these three laws and the language is absolutely chilling. But probably the most powerful work, in my opinion, was one called Encumbrance. And it uses the very fabric of 12 Carlton House Terrace, where the ICA is based, to, provide, to, to produce a really important piece, in my opinion, of activist art. I have to thank the gallery assistant in the upper gallery on the day that, that I visited, um, because he explained this piece to me, as well as the text, um, and it made a real difference. And it makes, it's wonderful when, when your experience is enhanced by, by um, gallery attendance. So thank you very, very much to him. I'm actually, because this um, piece, Encumbrance, uh, takes as its basis the very fabric, the doors and the, and the handrails of Carlton, um, how 12 Carlton House Terrace. I am going to show a few pictures of this and use some of Roland's text to explain the context. The work encumbrance comprises of a mahogany handrail, which you'll see in a minute, and four mahogany doors, all of which are part of the fabric of um, 12 Carlton House Terrace. Opposite two of those mahogany doors is some incredibly dense legalistic text which explain, from 2020 which seems to be explaining some kind of mortgage transaction. And um, it's when you have a look at the booklet, which I'm going to quote from now, that you realise this is an amazing piece of art activism. After taking the throne in 1820, George IV dismantled his residence, Carlton House, and the house of his parents, Buckingham House, combining elements from each to create Buckingham Palace. He built Carlton House Terrace between 1827 and 1832 on the former site of Carlton House as a series of elite rental properties to generate revenue for the Crown. 
All addresses at Carlton House Terrace are still owned by the Crown Estate, manager of land owned by the Crown since 1760. 12 Carlton House Terrace is leased by the Institute of Contemporary Arts. The building includes four mahogany doors and one mahogany handrail. These five mahogany elements were mortgaged by the Institute of Contemporary Arts to Encumbrance I Inc. on January 16, 2020 for £1,000 each. These loans will not be repaid by the ICA. A security for these outstanding debts, Encumbrance Inc. will retain a security interest in these mahogany elements. This interest will constitute an encumbrance on the future transaction of 12 Carlton House Terrace. An encumbrance is a right or interest in real property that does not prohibit its exchange but diminishes its value. The encumbrance will remain at 12 Carlton House Terrace as long as the mahogany elements are part of the building. As reparation, this encumbrance seeks to limit the property's continued accumulation of value for the Crown Estates. The Crown Estates provides 75% of its revenue to the Treasury and 25% directly to the monarch. The key word there is reparation. And this work forces us to think, as British viewers of this artwork, about the idea of atonement. Other countries who have had particularly dark periods of their history, such as Germany, have spent a lot of money and time atoning for past wrongs. Yet we have not really done this with slavery. And as I said earlier, it has created a large amount of the wealth of our country. This work, in the absence of atonement, in actively seeking to diminish the value of crown property of a monarchy that had benefited from slavery, was an incredibly powerful piece of art activism, in my opinion. So, overall, would I recommend this show? Yes, I would. I found this show perspective changing, and that's not something I would often say, having been to a to an art an art, an art exhibition. Why? Because it made me reconsider the history of my country. Obviously, Britain was one of the driving forces of the triangular slave trade, and merchants from Liverpool and Bristol and Southampton and London made vast fortunes from the violent capture and trading of uh, uh, and removal of human beings from Africa to the New World, to the Caribbean and North America in Britain's case. Um, in this show, the message is that this wealth um, created a kind of permanent base to our capitalist system. Banks today, such as Barclays Bank and HSBC, he is traced in, in, in the document, um, you have within them um, certain links to banks set up by slave merchants. There's a really poignant um, uh, exhibit called Mooring, which is just a statement that Cameron Rowland has hired a mooring um, spot at Albert Dock in Liverpool, clearly where, where Tate Liverpool is, and is leaving it symbolically empty for the duration of his show here. And I think that this is a really, really pertinent show to be shown, shown in Britain. And I suppose that, you know, slavery is, is a not very discussed part of our national history. We've been talking a lot in the last four years about how we're the fifth or sixth in Britain, um, biggest economy in the world. And yet we don't think, well, how did a small island on the edge of Europe get that position? So, yeah, I would absolutely recommend this um, exhibition. Um, and I would say as well that the ICA, a contemporary art space owned by the Crown Estates, is the absolutely perfect place for Roland to have his to make his UK debut. Overall, I would give this show seven out of ten. I would li have liked Roland to make a little bit more of the gallery space, but having said that, the the fact that there was only sixteen exhibits meant that every single one, whether it was the Gold Guinea or the Gillows writing case um, or the police searchlights, has stayed in my mind. And so, in some ways, he was being very, very canny. I think that sometimes art world and exhibitions need this kind of dense, academic, thoroughly researched um, piece to sort of to, to 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 give a contrast to the fr fr frivolity, excuse me, um, which often plagues modern art. So it's a really serious show, and I, for one, can't wait to see where Cameron Rowland goes next, and I will certainly be um, visiting his shows and keeping an eagle eye out. Um, next week on the Art Vlog, 
We'll be heading north from London to the Scottish capital city, Edinburgh, where I'll be bringing you a review of the show Leonardo da Vinci, A Life in Drawing, which is at the Queen's Gallery at Holyrood House, Palace of Holyrood House, I should say, at the bottom of the Royal Mile. Um, so do join me then and do subscribe to the art vlog. Um, and if you've been to the um, Cameron Rowland show and you agree with what I said or disagree, please do leave a comment below because I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for now. Over and out.